Hello everyone and welcome back to another video on the channel. Today we're going to be talking about 17 films that I watched at the online Sundance Film Festival. And Sundance is easily my favorite film festival because it is available online. It's the first one that gave me exposure to a lot of these films that you get to see coming out of film festivals. And it's one of the first ones of the entire year that kind of kicks off the year of films that we're going to get. And you know, in years past, we got a lot of great films like Coda. We got Radical, which was my favorites of Sundance last year. Fresh was another great one that came out of the Sundance Film Festival. And so this film festival just is a great way to kick off the year in 2024 of movies and we're going to be talking about 17 of them that I watched at the online festival this year and you know one year I'm actually going to go in person to Salt Lake City to watch the movies there because more so than other years there's a lot of films that were only available in person like I saw the TV glow, It's What's Inside, Love Lies Bleeding, A Different Man, so many films that I wanted to see were only available in person. But even still, I got a great list of films that I want to talk about here today in this video, so let's just jump into it. These are the 17 films that I watched at Sundance this year. So the first movie we're going to be talking about here is going to be called Handling the Undead. This is one of the only films that actually has a trailer for you to check out, and even though this is at the bottom of my list here, it's not a bad movie. I didn't dislike any of the movies that I watched here at the festival this year. This is an interesting take on the dead coming back from life. It's not necessarily a zombie story although it is at the same time but it's a unique more grounded take on this idea of the undead the idea of grief and how that thematically resonates with all the characters in this film that are experiencing this phenomenon where people start just raising from the dead and I'll say easily the best part of this film was its atmosphere its score and just the tone that the movie establishes from the very beginning that goes throughout the entire film because this movie has a sense of dread that is really interesting and it builds to an interesting place. I just wish that it kind of got to the point of what it was saying about grief, what it was saying about the undead by, you know, by the time you got to the end of the movie. I kind of wish that happened a little bit sooner because this is a very dragged out movie. You know, it felt a lot longer than it actually is. I think the pacing really hurts, although it does have a lot of great ideas in terms of having a very grounded story about the undead. The next one that I'll talk about here is going to be called Veni Vidi Vici. This movie is about the main art family who has a high standing in terms of the public I, you know, they have a lot of influence on politics, on the media, they have a lot of wealth, they can basically pay their way through any situation that they, you know, find themselves in. They are essentially completely consequence free, including the father of this family who is a serial killer known as the sniper, who is getting away with literally killing people on the street and nobody can do anything about it. And I would say that this is a very dark and twisted movie, although the tone that it you know presents this family is in a very lighthearted slice of life way where you're kind of just experiencing them living their life with the lack of consequences that they're facing with everything that they do. And that's what I mean by saying that this is a dark movie because these are terrible people. I hated every single person in this movie, but it's about this sort of lack of consequence that people in power have where they can literally do anything that they want and never face a consequence for. And so I think thematically, this movie has a lot of impact. And this movie, in terms of a lot of the f films that I watch in this festival, has stuck with me because of that idea, that core idea that this movie is about, even though I dreaded watching this movie for every single second. The next film on this list is called Exhibiting Forgiveness. It's about an artist who is essentially putting all his pain and all his grief in terms of his past, his difficult past that he had with his father, and this estranged relationship that he has with him in terms of growing up in a very, you know, traumatic way. And he puts it all out on his artwork and he has his gallery and all of a sudden his father comes back into his life and it causes a big rift in his life. It kind of halts everything and it causes a lot more I guess, you know, conflict than he needed at this point in his life. And it's dragging all this dirty laundry out of the closet and putting it full on public display. And it's a movie about abuse. It's a movie about the hardships that this character faced and how you as an artist put your own soul, your own pain into the work that you create and whether or not that forgiveness that you're, you know, portraying in your artwork is actually going to, you know, pan out in your real life when you're confronted with that person that caused you all this pain. And I think that this movie is an extremely powerful watch when it comes to those themes but it is an extremely heavy movie. And I think that's another thing that I'm realizing when I'm kind of ranking all these films is the ones that had a lot more darker consequences, a lot more depressing themes are gonna be lower on my list because this movie was extremely hard to watch. But this film is filled with a lot of fantastic performances, especially from Andre Holland, who is the main character in this film, and John Earl Jelix is the father in this film. Anjanou Ellis Taylor is also in this film, who was also in Origin. So this movie has an incredible cast of you know people playing these characters that's really made this movie watchable for me, but at the same time, it is filled with a lot of you know dark themes, and you're watching a lot of terrible things happen on screen that it kind of did bring me down. It's a very depressing movie as well, but a lot of great performances, well-directed, 
again, just another tough one to watch. The next movie that I want to talk about is called Between the Temples. This movie stars Carol Kane and Jason Schwartzman, who is a cantor who is basically in a crisis in faith. He's having a full-on midlife crisis, and his middle school music teacher comes back into his life, who is much older than himself, but wants to be, uh, wants to learn about the bat mitzvah, wants to go through her own bat mitzvah, even though she's a lot older than the general bat mitzvah student. And so it's a movie about him essentially teaching her, falling in love, having this weird love story between these two characters that essentially brings him back to his faith. And when it comes to movies about crises and faith, I, I, I enjoy them. I think they always have a good character arc to them, even though I'm not religious in any sort of way. I do think that this movie and its arc in this film is meaningful. I think whatever can bring you back to that faith is always going to be an intriguing story, even if it has a lot of uncomfortable and weird moments in this film. This movie absolutely nails the awkward dinner scene twice in this film, to a point where it is also extremely hard to watch and extremely cringy to watch the situations that these characters find themselves in in this film, but it was a good watch. I will say my biggest downfall in this film is... I mean, it, it just, it looks old. Like, it, it, I think it's filmed on film, but it's really grainy. It's very specific with its direction and its style that it, it just kind of distracted me throughout the entire movie. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just, it was kind of odd to see a movie that's in this festival look like it was kind of made very scrappily, even though I think that was very much the intent from the director. I don't know, I just found it a little bit distracting, but story-wise, character-wise, I thought it was interesting, even though there's a lot of very cringy moments in this movie. Take the weird out of Saltburn, maybe sprinkle in a little melancholy in its place, and he gets Brief History of a Family. This movie is a Chinese film. It follows this kid in high school who is very lonely. He doesn't have a lot of friends until he makes this one friend, and he slowly starts integrating himself into the life of this family. And, you know, this takes place during post-one child policy China and so it has a lot of thematic elements that relate to this idea of you know these families being forced to only have one child and so there's a weird sibling rivalry that's kind of going on in this film that feels extremely twisted and dark and there's a lot of secrets and a lot of unspoken words that are in this film that sets this overall melancholic tone throughout the entire film. The way I feel about this movie is kind of similar to how I felt about handling the undead where you know this movie has great cinematography, has a great score, has this droning atmosphere throughout the entire film that is extremely well done even though it has a much slower pace to back that up than something like Saltburn in terms of these story comparisons that I have here but that atmosphere and that tone and those unspoken words and those themes that are permeated throughout this entire film is extremely interesting. I, I can't wait for this to come out for more people to see it, for more people to kind of put their own thoughts and picking together, you know, what this movie fully means, you know, especially when it comes to the one child policy in China. I don't know a lot about that policy or about how that affected families in that, you know, time period. And so I think this movie does have a lot more to say than I can pick apart on surface value, but I'm very curious to see what people end up saying about this movie when it is finally released. The next film that I want to talk about here is called Pony Boy. This movie stars River Gallo and Dylan O'Brien, and I might have, you know, gone into this movie excited to see Dylan O'Brien's role in this film, but I came out extremely happy with River Gallo's performance in this film, who plays this intersex worker who's tied together into the mob, into a drug deal gone wrong, and who is then on the run in this film, and it's it just takes place over the course of one night as things kind of spiral out of control, and River Gallo in this film is phenomenal. I have never heard of this actor before, but he was really great, and his arc that he goes through in this film is pretty profound, even though it takes place over a singular night, and I think that is what I want to take away from this film most, is this core performance, the arc here, and the style of this film, because this movie is soaked in a lot of neon colored lights, it's very colorful, and the cinematography takes full advantage of that. This movie looks absolutely incredible and I think the story I don't really love mob stories too much I think the mob element of this film I did it's really I wasn't too invested in because I was mainly invested in this main character and the flashbacks to his past and all these different ideas of what this person is going through at this point in his life. The next movie that I want to talk about here on my list is one of the most interesting movies that I watched at the entire festival. It's called Love Me. It stars Kristen Stewart and Steven Yeun as a satellite and a buoy that fall in love after the extinction of humanity. This is a weird one, guys. This one is completely out there. It's come with very mixed reactions out of the festival because of how odd the premise is, and I don't want to get into too much details about what this movie is actually about because I think that is the best part of this entire film is its style, the way it tells this love story between two inanimate objects, these two essentially AIs, is very interesting, and it goes in directions that you wouldn't expect, and it kind of portrays this love story in ways that you didn't expect. It has a lot of different mediums that it's playing with in this film. In terms of its style, it's completely wild and out there and original. I've never really seen a movie exactly like this, and 
it's one of those one of kind movies that if you see without knowing anything about it, it makes it just that much more interesting. Although there are some aspects of this film that might be tedious to some people. I love the weirdness of this movie, but from what I see out of the mixed reviews out of this movie is a lot of people are not vibing with the weird tone that this movie has and I just go in there with tempered expectations. It's wild, it's weird, and maybe it's for you. But if you keep an open mind, you might just enjoy this movie as much as I did. The Sundance Film Festival is always filled with a lot of great documentaries. I think there's actually two Best Documentary nominees this year at the Oscars that premiered at Sundance. I think The Eternal Memory and 20 Days in Mariupol both premiered last year at Sundance, and this year is no different with a lot of great documentaries. One that I was extremely excited for is called Skywalker's A Love Story. This movie is essentially a cross between Fire of Love, which is also a Sundance premiere, and Free Solo, which if you've seen those two documentaries, they're both great in their own ways this kind of mashes together this love story but in this extremely dangerous situation where you're having these people climb up to the top of skyscrapers top of cranes and dangle off them pose off of them in very risky ways without any wires without any you know harnesses whatsoever and it's extremely thrilling i'm sure you've seen pictures of skywalkers before in the past just on the internet these extremely daring and terrifying pictures of these people hanging off of these buildings that is absolutely thrilling but i think what is even more interesting about this documentary is not just them you know on top of those places taking those pictures and how dangerous that is but it's them getting there that is equally as illegal and dangerous this movie plays as a straight up heist movie in the last 30 minutes of this film as they break through security as they weave between all these construction workers and security cameras and all these different places where they could potentially be caught at any moment in their attempt to get to the top of the merdeka skyscraper and it is it's terrifying. It is so thrilling and gripping that it is one of the best sequences in a film that I watched at this festival. I think the biggest downfall of this film, unfortunately, is that a lot of the film feels scripted because, you know, the main cast, they don't speak English, so they have to read off the, I guess, their story in a scripted manner, which is, you know, a lot of documentaries do that. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but when the movie feels real and raw, it feels absolutely thrilling when it is more scripted when it's more than telling the story of how they got to this place it's a little bit less thrilling it's a little bit more scripted essentially and i liked when this movie was completely raw and natural i also bought three tickets to some of the award winners at the festival this year and one of those was called in the summers this one won for the grand jury prize and for the best directing prize at the u.s dramatic competition at this year's festival and i really enjoyed this movie this movie follows these these kids who go on these summer visits to their father in mexico and this father is a very complicated character he's He's very loving in his own type of way. You know, he has a lot of great moments with these kids, a lot of, you know, heartwarming moments with these kids, but he's also a drunk. He's also very flawed. He has a lot of moments where he's a, a really bad father, but there's still this love between these characters that feel very real. And I think what I love most about this movie is that it very much feels like you're a fly on the wall. There's not really a script in this movie that feels like they're reading off of a script. I think the director said in the interview afterwards that they cut a lot of dialogue out of the movie because just the looks from the performers said everything you need to know. So this is very much a slice of life story where, you know, I think some audiences may be unengaged in this story because of the slower pace that it has, but I was locked in the entire time because I liked these characters. This father was such a complicated and complex character to watch that the entire film and also spans, you know, a couple decades of these kids as young kids as they get into their teenage years and it skips to where they are adults and I think that the story that is told in this film is very touching, very heartwarming, but also very tense at times, very awkward at times. And it's this complicated love that is told between this sibling relationship, between this parenthood and fatherly relationship in this film that was very interesting. The next film on my list is going to be called Little Death. Now, the Sundance Film Festival is broken up into a bunch of different sections. There's the Worldwide Dramatic Competition. There's the, the U.S. Dramatic Competition, which I saw most of the films out of the U.S. Dramatic Competition this year. There's, you know, the documentaries. There's, of course, the Midnight Selection, which was all in person this year. But there's also the Next category, which has a bunch of experimental films from filmmakers that are very daring, that are deciding to make movies in very unique and different ways. And they're usually the films where you can say no other film is like this. And this is definitely one of those that is going to be extremely divisive because of how weird it is with how bizarre the first half of the movie is versus how grounded the second half of the movie is because this is essentially two completely different movies that feel like they're comp completely directed by two separate people two different ideas of how to make a movie 
that couldn't literally literally could not be more different like one half uses ai it's shot digitally the next half is shot on film and it's very grounded and it's kind of thematically about the same time but at the same time you kind of have to piece that together as a film goes on because i think this movie thematically has a lot to say about drug use about abuse of power about abuse of the status in life that you're in and it kind of balances these different things in a very bizarre way that's just worked for me and this movie is going to be extremely divisive and it's not going to work for a lot of people but there's something about the last half of this movie that really clicked for me that made me look back at the first half in a new light where i did enjoy that after the fact because it's weird it's wild i hate the use of ai but i'll give it a pass because i think it has something to say about it it's just odd the next film on my list made me cry actually made me cry quite a bit. This movie's called Evil Inn. It follows a Norwegian gamer with a muscular disease where he slowly starts losing the ability to move, to walk, to move his arms. He's stuck in a wheelchair and he slowly degenerates in his muscular ability until the point where he died extremely early in his life. And really the only thing that he had was his computer, World of Warcraft, and just gaming essentially. And it's very sad with how it frames the story for the first act of this movie where his family was sad that he was never going to experience a lot of things. He was never going to experience friendship. He was never going to experience love because he felt so isolated. He felt this lack of ability to connect with people because he was so different. And when he finally did die, you know, uh, several years ago, his parents were crushed by that, that he wasn't able to live a full life until they got his password for his computer and they logged in. They posted on a forum that he had passed away. And all these people that he played on World of Warcraft with came together in a very loving way and explored how he did live a full life, that he did love, that he did experience all these things within this virtual world. And although this movie wasn't in the next category, it feels like it was very much, you know, it, it could have easily been in the next category instead of the documentary category because this movie is told in a very interesting way because of his virtual life in the game of World of Warcraft and how they have all the, the text logs from this game where they can essentially see his entire life throughout thousands and thousands of, of gameplay hours that he had on this game and they can piece together his story throughout this game so they animate his life in this game using the avatars that he played as in this world of warcraft world with the friends that he made along the way and this love that he had in this game and it tells his life story essentially all animated through the the avatar that he lived as for so many years free of the wheelchair that he was stuck in throughout the the majority of his life and it was absolutely crushing again i cried a lot during this movie especially in the first act but then as the movie progresses and you see what his life was inside of the game itself the friends and the connections that he made the mistakes that he also made along the way with his you know very you know depressed mind you know throughout his life where he got in these funks he got in these moods where he was mean to his friends online where he felt like he couldn't open up to them and it was a very heartbreaking story but it was also a very I guess, loving story. It felt like a really, a very loving story, a very loving tribute to this person who did live a full life. The next film won the Audience Award at the documentary section of the film festival. It is called Daughters. This movie essentially follows all these kids, all these daughters of incarcerated fathers, essentially. These prisoners who go through this program, this 10-week fatherhood program, where it all leads up to a father-daughter dance where they can have a visitation with their kids that is more than just seeing them behind a sheet of glass because these, these people were locked up for very bad reasons. And the movie never goes into the reasons as to why they were locked up in the first place because it wants to paint the picture of them as people that made mistakes that can possibly get out of this. It has a lot of statistics in saying that you know, the people that went through this program have a lot higher chance of never being arrested again because this program really is, is a big reform in their lives. It's very much a rehabilitation tactic that gets people out of jails instead of a cycle where they keep on getting arrested and arrested and arrested like this one father that is in this film that is told to have you know every time he got out of jail he spent three months free and he went right back to jail after committing another crime and he had one of the most interesting stories because once he went through this program once he went through this fatherhood program and was seen to possibly be reformed it's been six years since he's been in jail and it was an absolutely beautiful story being told for this father in general and this one also brought a tear to my eye. It's very touching. It's very heartwarming. And in terms of the prison system in the United States, reform is a thing that's not focused on a lot. And this movie highlights the good that can come out of jail, that it is possible to be reformed, that it is possible to come out of this 
you know, prison system as a better person that is, a, you know, a functioning member of society after this instead of being thrown away in a lot of different ways that the prison system usually does handle things. And so this was probably one of the more impactful documentaries at the festival that I think maybe could be in a situation where 20 Days of Mariupol and Eternal Memory were after the after the year's over. Maybe it could be, you know, put up for some Oscar nominations next year. Who knows? This one was very, very well done. The next film on my list is called Didi. This movie is directed by Sean Wing, and it was another award winner at the festival this year. I believe it won for the Audience Award at the U.S. Dramatic Competition, and this movie follows a 13-year-old Taiwanese-American boy who is essentially going through his coming-of-age story, where he's having a girlfriend for the first time, going to parties, learning to skate. It's very much similar to mid-90s if you've seen that film, especially when it comes to a skater kid meeting some skater friends, you know, practicing in the garage and finally going out with them and going to a party that he's definitely too young to. It has a lot of similar beats to movies that you've seen in the past that are other coming of age stories like Super Bad, like the boys or good boys i think it was called or mid 90s or something like that and so i wouldn't say this movie is necessarily very original but because it is from the perspective of somebody who is taiwanese in america i think it brings lots in terms of the family dynamics that are very different in this film and you know he's much younger than a lot of these other films you know portrayed these kids and he very much does feel like a kid in this movie and it's very much a snapshot of the early 2000s that feels very specific to sean wang as as a director because this movie does feel extremely personal i think that's the biggest compliment that I can give this film is that it it feels like a movie that only he could make because of how specific some situations are. There's a lot of really funny moments in this movie, particularly with the fish and the squirrel. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about, but there's a lot of great moments in this film, a lot of relatability in this that I really did enjoy. The next movie on my list is called Rob Peace. This is a biopic based on a true story of the title character in this film. It stars Jay Will and Chiwetel Ejiofor, who also directed this film, and I absolutely loved this movie and you know as a lot of biopics I have a very specific taste when it comes to biopics where I don't like the you know fast montages through somebody's life that feel like it's just kind of racing through to tell this person's entire story or at least the idea of somebody's entire story I like movies that get a little bit more personal a little bit more drawn out that have a slower pace that feel like it is a character study of this person I think that is exactly what Chiwetel Ejiofor does with this film and I think that Jay Will is an incredible performer in this movie he plays the older Rob Peace as he grows up into this film and I absolutely loved this performance easily maybe my favorite performance of the entire festival I really did like this actor and in terms of the story that it tells I think it is extremely impactful as this kid who you know always is pulled into the wrong direction because life just keeps on knocking him down even though he's a very bright and smart person just the situation that he finds himself in throughout the entirety of his life is is always tragic. It's always frustrating. It's always sad to see the direction that he goes in in this film. But he's never you never feel like you're putting the blame on him for it because it's the situation at large, how his life is going. And it's so tragic because of that. And I, I really like the story that this one told. I think it's based on a book, which is probably why I think the story is told in a lot more slower and more personal way because I think it's written by one of his friends that actually knew him in his life and so this is definitely one that I think you should keep an eye out for when this one is released. I think this is a bigger film out of the festival that hopefully does get a big release in theaters that I don't know if it will get awards pushed but if it does I'd love to see Jay Will in contention for it. All right so we've reached the top three films of the Sundance Film Festival with Black Box Diaries. This is the final documentary that has made my list. This is directed by Shiori Ito and essentially follows this woman who was raped in her early 20s trying to get the man responsible prosecuted for these crimes but since it is in Japan and their laws are very much geared to protect those abusers it is an extremely harrowing journey of her trying to get any sort of justice for what was committed to her all those years ago and this one was a tough watch at times it was a very emotional journey to watch this film from beginning to end I also watched this immediately after Veni Vidi Vici which you know that movie is about these people getting away with all these terrible crimes and to watch this movie directly after that was extremely emotionally draining I think what I loved most about this documentary is yes it is about very heavy and very dark subject matter with what she experienced in her life and there's a lot of moments in this film that are extremely hard to listen to you know some calls that she had to the police trying to get them to help her was very hard to listen to a lot of these things but her journalistic integrity of how she went about you know getting this all done and, and how she you know goes forward and changing the legal system in Japan at least trying to change the legal system in Japan was extremely thrilling to watch throughout the majority of this film and I think her personality and this the sense of yes her life has changed forever and she has a lot of sadness within her because of everything that has happened but she still 
joyful in a lot of this movie. She has a lot of great fun moments in this film, just living her life now in a completely different way, trying to be a symbol of hope for a lot of people in Japan, being the kind of the forward momentum for Japan before even the Me Too movement happened in the United States and this story even being boosted by the Me Too movement. And so there's a lot of great stuff in this film. This documentary took a long time for her to make because it took a long time for even the smallest bit of change, which I think is the most... I guess important thing about this film but also the most depressing thing about this film and I hope that this movie is seen by a lot of people I hope that this movie's creation and this story that is being told from her own perspective being a journalist and telling her story in a very impactful manner actually does result in some change in Japan my second favorite film from the Sundance Film Festival is called Thelma this is a movie that's tonally is completely different from the last film that I talked about this one is a comedy about a 93 year old woman who is scammed from a bunch of computer scammers out of $10,000 is very much a similar premise and set up to Beekeeper, which if you saw Beekeeper, my review for Beekeeper, you know how I felt about that movie. But this movie essentially follows her, this 93-year-old woman, on a revenge story to try to get her money back, essentially. And this movie plays like a Tom Cruise action thriller. And Tom Cruise has nothing on June Squibb, who does a lot of her own stunts in this film, which they talked about in the in the interview after the movie screened at the festival. And I loved this movie so much. The tone of this thing, the humor of this thing, and June Squibb as this character was so funny to watch throughout this film. And the way that it portrays this character's, I guess, journey climbing up stairs but it kind of edits it and the music behind it is that of an action thriller is so incredibly funny. And again, it's a revenge story of her trying to get her money back. And it's also about, you know, aging, about getting older in your life and having your family feel like you can't go out and do all these things. It's very limiting and it's very sad to see, you know, this woman is feeling limited by her family because of her age, essentially. And it, it has a lot to say about that, but it's just really a really fun time at the movies. And I really hope this movie is released in theaters. Like I said, I hope you hear a lot about it. I hope it gets bought soon by some studio because I'd love to see this in a packed audience just laughing because it's one of the best comedies I've seen in quite a while with a lot of really funny performances here. This is also one of the final performances from Richard Roundtree, who was extremely funny in this movie as another companion for Thelma to go on this adventure with, even though she's kind of pushing her family back. Clark Rigg is one of the, the characters in this movie as well, who was extremely funny to watch in this film. And it's just, it's just a good time. I think with a lot of the films that I watched at Sundance, a lot of them had a lot of heavy themes or a lot of emotional journeys that were very depressing at times. And this movie was just a breath of fresh air, extremely fun and endearing. All right, guys, we've reached the end of my list for Sundance 2024. And my favorite film was Jesse Eisenberg's new film, A Real Pain. And I was really surprised that this one ended up being my favorites of the festival because I did not like Jesse Eisenberg's first film as director when he finished Saving the World. I watched that a couple years ago at Sundance and I wasn't really too impressed. It was filled with a bunch of characters that I did not like. And this movie is a complete 180 to what that first film was because I loved every single character in this film. I thought all their journeys was great in this. It was very well directed and I love the cast. Of course, Jesse Eisberg is starring in this movie as well alongside Kieran Culkin who play cousins who decide to go over to Poland to a Holocaust tour ending off at their grandmother's house who survived the Holocaust when she was in Poland. And this movie has a lot of heavy thematic moments when it comes to these characters reconciling with their past, but it also is a really funny comedy. This feels a lot more in line from what you'd get, from what you at least expect for Jesse Eisenberg behind the camera and as a writer of this film. I also love the title of this movie, A Real Pain, because it has so many different meanings. I think on surface level, it's about, you know, Kieran Culkin's character who is he's a real pain. He's just a nuisance to Jesse Eisenberg's character who is the more grounded one in this relationship. Of course, he has that, you know, nerdy and, and really frantic, I guess, you know, mannerisms behind Jesse Eisenberg that he has always, even in his real life in the interview after the movie. He was very mantic in that interview as well and very twitchy that he is just as a person. So his character is essentially playing Jesse Eisenberg. But Kieran Culkin is that wild card where he can be a person that brings all these people together on this Holocaust tour. He's a really funny guy. Everybody loves him, but he also has these moments of outburst where he kind of brings everybody down because he has all this trauma built up in his past. He has this guilt. He has this pain that he's going through in his life that 
has really bogged him down that makes him so, so much more of an interesting and, and in-depth character than he was at surface value. And it's the same thing with the title. There's so much more to that meaning of a real pain. What is pain in these people's lives as compared to her to their grandparents who literally survived the Holocaust. And so I found this movie to be extremely endearing from beginning to end, along with a lot of great emotions. I think of all the films that I saw at Sundance, this is easily the biggest one that is no doubt going to get a big theatrical release. Like if this one just goes straight to streaming, I'll be extremely upset because this one deserves to be seen in a theater for one. I wish I went to Sundance in person to see this because it is deserved to see on the big screen to, to experience with a group of people in an audience laughing at the funny scenes, crying at the sad scenes, and just reveling in just the experience of watching this film. And so I hope this movie gets a big theatrical release. And I know a lot of these films, like it's January, it's way too early to kind of root for award season. I think this movie might fade away by the time we get, you know, a year from now when we're talking about awards for 2025. But if it somehow sticks around all the way up until then, it'd be great to see Kieran Culkin get a supporting nomination for this because he is so good in this movie that's Honestly, I'm just so happy that I watched this movie because it just it had a lot of impact on me and Kieran Culkin was great. But that's going to be it from me for my 17 films that I saw at Sundance this year. I really loved a lot of these films that I watched at the festival and I cannot wait for you guys to see them because, you know, it might take a while for some of them to be released. I believe sometimes I think about dying is only in theaters like this weekend when Sundance was a year ago, you know, to the date essentially. And it's kind of crazy that it can be that long until these movies can be picked up, bought and distributed by the studios that pick them up. But hopefully some of these films are released sooner than later so we can all talk about them. And if you were at the Sundance Film Festival and did see these movies, comment down below what you thought of all these films or with some of the other ones that you saw at the festival because I'm sure there's a lot of them that I didn't get to see like it's what's inside I cannot wait for that one to be released so I can actually watch it because I'm I love the horror films and sadly I didn't get to watch many this year but that is going to be it for my review for all these Sundance movies this year if you enjoyed this video make sure you guys leave a like comment down below and subscribe to the channel to see more reviews just like this one and I hope to see you all on my next one mm -hmm.